Thank you for joining us this morning. It's lovely to see everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about our development effort for Agile and Base Turbo Machinery Optimization Problems. It's something that we've been working on for a while and it's a very um, requested feature within the community. So just a little bit of context uh, about why we want to do this. Uh, turbo Machinery Optimization is a very, very requested feature in SU2. If you've looked at the Slack channel in the past year, yeah, I think there's a new message every single week. If you go on CFD online, there's a new post every single week. I'm sure if you look in Mateo's email inbox, he probably gets a new email every single week. Um, but these are very complex problems that are owned by lots of constraints and lots of design variables, uh, depending on whichever method you want to, just, uh, want to use. But um, if we want to use a gradient-based method, it we require really uh, fast and efficient computations of uh, objective function sensitivities. So this is perfect for new joints. Now you've probably seen many papers uh, detailing uh, turbo machinery joints in the past, but it has, uh, but it has never really existed in main uh, our own master. This is the aim of this work is we're going to finally get what uh, has existed in various branches of the years into, into master so that people could stop sending messages to the Slack channel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the, what we're going to talk about today, Ole is going to take the first half. He's going to talk about derivative computation SU2, um, how we record the uh, objective function tape, and then we're going to talk, give an example of a, the debug mode that uh, he's implemented. And then I'm going to continue on with that and give a practical example of how we solve uh, uh, issues with the tape recording uh, uh, with the term machine specific feature. Just a pre-warning, the following is very, very work in progress. Um, I can make no guarantees that uh, this is correct or will work for you, um, but it's quite there. So, with that, I'll give hand you over to Okay. Question. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, in order to show you what difficulties there there are when we uh, when we want to um, when we want to um, cover new features, new solvers uh, with our, with the discrete adjoint solver that we have. Uh, let me very briefly, very briefly explain uh, um, how the discrete adjoint solver works. And uh, let me first of all start off with the basic setting where we are using the discrete adjoint solver. So if we want to compute derivatives of our objective function with respect to some design parameters, we must at some point differentiate to the whole program. At some point, we have to do that. And, uh, and if we are using the discrete adjoint method, uh, this differentiation through the whole program code, so you, that's the solution involving the, the, the flow solver, for instance, uh, and um, if we want to, if we go uh, via the discrete adjoint method, method, this differentiation through the whole program code is somehow transferred to the discrete adjoint equation. So uh, this whole differentiation takes part uh, when we solve the discrete adjoint equation where R, whereby R we denote the solver by U the state variables by lambda the discrete adjoint solution objective function. And yeah, that's the basic linear equation that we want to form. And um, um, what we see is that for the assembly of this uh, of this equation, we need to compute these derivatives. So these derivatives, as well as this Jacobian. Uh, for computing this Jacobian, we could either either use a forward mode of algorithmic differentiation, which means that we have this huge Jacobian, and then we go uh, computing each column by column uh, separately. For so for each. For each uh, for each state variable, we have, would have to differentiate uh, through the whole program code, which can of course uh, which can of course recover being efficient. Alternatively, we can compute a computational graph of our whole computer program code during during its execution. Save that computational graph and use this graph for computing derivatives later on, which is called the reverse mode. Um, and this is exactly what we use for the discrete adjoint solver. So where we can, uh, it, uh, where we can uh, uh, compute this matrix vector product that we need for some solver, however it is defined later on. 
but the default method is a fixed point uh, method, but that's not important at this point. So uh, we use this uh, the reverse mode for computing these kind of matrix sector products. That's a takeaway method. Um, um, and as you do, this happens um, either the forward mode, the forward propagation of derivatives, or the backwards uh, computation. Uh, happens uh, through overloading of floating point times in Cody pack, either by a forward type or a reverse type. Sorry. Um, so this is somewhere somewhere uh, appearing at the very beginning of the code, and from that on, uh, all types, all floating point times in S2 are replaced by a type that can do these derivative computations in the background. And then the whole discrete adjoint solver for a very simple case, like a two by two matrix, uh, uh, it's just, it's a, it's, it boils down, boils down to, to such a code. It consists of a set gradient part where we, where we are initializing these derivatives of an evaluation part of the computational graph, evaluating this matrix product. And finally, uh, we are extracting the, um, the derivatives. So this is actually what happens in the discrete adjoint solver. Um, and before we can run this evaluation part, the discrete adjoint solver has to um, record the tape. And this is done by registering the inputs, calling all the solver parts, registering the outputs, and then the tape is saved and the discrete adjoint solver can run. So seems simple. Um, so um, 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 and it is simple to some point. So on the one hand, this, this, this whole assembly of the discrete adjoint equation and the solver is done, um, automatically via algorithmic differentiation. On the other hand, there are some mistakes that we can run into. Um, what are these kind of mistakes? Um, so what can happen here? So one typical mistake that can happen is that we are missing to register a variable variable that we want to compute uh, derivatives with respect to later on. Um, another mistake that happens is an error, similar error that appears when we are using free accumulation regions. So we have a registered variable, and then in that free accumulation region, we have a variable that depends on this registered variable which is not registered as an input for the free accumulation region. And then we cut this dependency from there on. And then like we have mathematical incorrect derivatives later on. Those are probably, uh, those one can probably find manually. Um, but there is one type of mistake that we are, that we think we are running into quite often. Uh, is uh, that um, it? That's an error that I like to refer to as some kind of turbulence error. Um, so we have our input values, and then in that in the in the solver parts, there is another value not registered as input that the solver depends on, which is later sent in a some kind of post processing routine. So which is included too late into this into this dependency chain, giving mathematically incorrect. Um, derivative and how we can refine such an error. And luckily, uh, Cody Hack, the tool, the algorithmic differentiation tool that we use, as comes with a tag type. So in this tag type, instead of derivative information, carries additional information uh, in form of a tag, which is just an integer number that we can set individually. And then we can build a deeper run by uh, doing a recording with an initial tag and a second recording, second sequence recording with a with another check tag. And um, let me show you a brief example for for handing over to Josh Kern how this how this uh, how this can resolve this kind of turbulence error that I was just mentioning. So imagine we are registering inputs. We have some pre-processing routine depending on another input. We are running the solver and then too late we are setting the, we are setting the 
Um, we are setting this input value. So to think of this as a turbulence quantity for it to solve it depending on the turbulence. But this is said at this point that we, if we set the turbulence quantity once the solver has run, which is fine if we, if we run it in the primal mode where we are just iterating until it converges, but which is mathematically incorrect if we are recording in this, in this, uh, in this, in this way. So in the first recording, um, we are setting a tag one to both these values, and the W tag is set to zero. Then we do the preprocess and iterate, um, and then we set this, and then the, the tag of W is set to one in that post-processing routine. And so how does this checked recording now unveils this mystery? Uh, in the second recording, uh, U1 and T2 will be tagged two, but uh, W still carries the one from the two ways you've got in go off because it was set in a post-processing routine, so too late, right? And now this, this, this approach unveils this error, this mathematical error. The thought what happened now is, um, that we, that there is some arithmetic operation, um, of types tag two and tag one. And this will then throw an error that we then can catch in a debugger. And the debugger will then point us to a line of code where apparently something goes wrong or where we have high where, where there's a highly suspicious region where we need to, where we have a minus or mistake. Uh, right. And uh, Josh will now explain how this, how, how we use that debug mode uh, precisely for finding mistakes. And as you do it for finding this remaining mistakes, uh, <laughs> to cover, cover turbine machinery with our discrete and choice. Yeah. So. Uh, for this example, I'm going to be using a 2D axial turbo uh, stage. It's an extremely coarse mesh, so only about 80k elements. If you've ever opened the turbo machinery test case holder, it's the axial stage 2D. Um, these are two adjacent blade rows set by the in plane, and we are using, as a design variable, we're using an FFD box that's so defined by nine design variables. So, very, very simple case. So, how do I use this tool? Well, once we've compiled it, and we run it, we're going to get an output that looks something like this. So here we see that the debug run, we have our initial recording, we set the tag one, then we do that second recording, we take tag two, and we get a little one in here. Use of variables by tag one should be two. So now what we want to do is we want to find out what which line of code is throwing this error. So using your favorite debugger, I like to use the Visual Studio Code. We set a nice little breakpoint in the error check. This is in Cody Pack. Um, I like to set it just at the end of the function. You can get all these little, uh, all this extra information that can, that can help you. Um, so once we've set this breakpoint, we're then going to look at our stack trades. And you'll see the first half of this, all these areas you know is coding. This is the stuff that Cody is handling, uh, obviously. Um, and we probably don't need to worry about this. As, uh, if, we, if we're debugging our SU2 code, we, let's leave Cody alone. So we're going to start here. Uh, C config get pressure out by condition. So let's have a look at what's going on here. So this is the code that you'll find in uh, C config. And um, we're going to inspect this value, Giles variable one. So this Giles variable one is the value that, is spe that you specify in your config. Uh, and if we have a look at our debugger, we see here we have a tag zero. Why? Why is this a tag zero? Should be it should be tagged in our in our recording, uh, because uh, a large part of this will come down to experience with the code and uh, uh, just a general issue to code experience. I know when I'm looking at this, and this is just fetching some information from a uh, the config file. It's not necessarily a, a part part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the next step, which is in register variables, and here we see this code. So in register solution, we have uh, a back pressure at uh, the temperature, which is uh, uh, turned from our config file, is then registered as an input, and then the, that is set back to the config file for use in the, uh, uh, in the solver. So here, the first recording is tag zero, because it's passive, and the second recording is tag one. This creates a tag mismatch here. The variables in the first recording are then set back into the config file with a tag zero, which is why you get this 
a value is set to zero when the form we first inspect it. So this is actually a very simple fix. All we have to do is remove this two lines of code after the uh, register input. Um, and here, the first recording is type one and the second recording is type two. If you look in this function, this is going to look a little bit different to the other uh, comp the compressible Excel error line, the stuff that's not turbo machinery. Uh, and that's because those variables are solver variables, whereas this fact pressure value and temperature uh, in the implementation of Giles, uh, it's it's not directly used. Uh, we use um, uh, the back pressure and the temperature to calculate characteristic jumps. So this is why it looks a little bit different, which is why it might look a bit strange uh, to some people. So now I'm going to show some preliminary results with what we've done. This red dashed line is a, a a comparison between gradients of the sleeve joint and the finite difference uh, uh, as a percentage, a, a difference percentage. This uh, red line is uh, what is currently on develop. Uh, the green line was after we did some initial the initial cleanup of some of the turbo machinery uh, legacy code, shall we say. And then this black line here, which almost looks like it's exactly zero, is uh, is after we've done the first debugging of the uh, debug tape. So you can see we already made quite a significant process, and you'd be almost fooled if you looked at this graph to think that, you know, we, oh, we've solved it straight away. However, we zoom in, we still see that we have a difference of between, you know, 1.5 and 2%. And if you think about uh, Toby's presentation yesterday, where he had a, diff a relative difference of 10 to the minus 6, uh, this is what we're going for. So there's still some work to do, but we're making some progress. So what's next? Uh, we're going to do some further verification and validation using the SG2 server test cases that Mateo talked about. Uh, we intend to integrate this into the regression test pipeline on GitHub so that even if you're not interested in server machinery uh, and you want to develop some uh, new adjoint capabilities, you can very you can very easily use this uh, to test whether you're doing something right. Okay. And then further down the line, there'll be an upcoming publication. So keep your eyes peeled for that if you want to read about that. Uh, so thank you for your uh, thank you for your interest. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Acknowledge the support by by Max Yeah, made us aware of. The circumstance, the fact that he is also offering an attack time that we are now using a lot, so yeah, also acknowledge his community. Yeah, without without that, I think we'd probably be sort of stuck chasing our tails. It's a very very <laughs> useful tool. All right, thanks, uh, Josh and uh, Ole. So, uh, tell me. Uh, yeah, I have a question: whether like if you restart the simulation, it's just one inspiration. So, I, uh, so one test I was did was I ran a simulation for uh, an X number of times for some number of iterations, then another one for X minus one, mm -hmm. and restart for one iteration and check whether I have the same residuals. And if I stand it correctly, the problem is when you take that you use a variable that in this pre post processing stuff was post processed to make on the primary recording, it doesn't hold the whole correct value, right? Mm -hmm. So, like with your, that's of course a very intriguing way to do the via the pre testing or via AD. But I'm wondering whether you check this kind of just residual of the primal and the primal restart, whether you get a match there and how, how does it translate to this work? Um, it wasn't a method that I'd used and it's not something I'm familiar with, so I can't really comment, but I assume that you would see some mismatch. Um, it's definitely something that I think we could try, um, but yeah, it's not something that I'd considered. But there's there's all, there's also I think there's also I think issues with um, restarting. Cool. Um, so, I, but, but I think so. So if there's in this debug mode. Are we talking about the debug mode or this is so in this debug mode there is no residual, there is no iteration. There's just recording. There's the, the only debug mode of a 
initial recording and the sequential um, following second recording. And there is no event, there is no take evaluated part anywhere. It, there, there, right, there's no residual. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and it, it, it unveils this, this mistake. Um, by hinting us to points in the code where we have this tag mismatch, this 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 mismatch that's uh, highly suspicious for a mathematical problem. If if you'd like a little demonstration of the tool in action, I have it on my laptop. <laughs> I can. Uh, <laughs> I can. Tool in action. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the tutorial session. Yes, Mr. So the, the sampling of the code is that active by default, or you have to give something to activate it? And we you have to compile with a different option. Um, so you compile with the Cody type uh, tag, um, which I don't think is currently in the master version of um, Cody, and it's also definitely not in the current ma uh, master version of uh, SU2. If you look on the uh, one of our pull requests we have open, the one that we mentioned before, you can see how to do that. But it's 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 it's, a, it's not an option that you have to specify in a config. When you compile with type tag, you are running the debug mode. You won't get any. You'll get. Uh, it it'll just be complete nonsense. Uh, more questions on use it, but then see what pop on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So there's a question online from uh, Ivan McBean. Uh, he says, uh, "Hi, Josh. Thanks a lot for your work. When do you think to machinery objectives efficiency mass flow will be available again in the main branch? So, how many hours of work? I mean, into putting those back in the main branch is maybe like twenty minutes of work. To be honest, it's not particularly difficult um, because of the, some of the changes that we've made over the past year. Um, if he would like to use it for the thing, then." Uh, feel free to contact me and I'll show you how to implement it. But in terms of putting it like in the main branch, my intention is to put it all together with this. It doesn't, it feels a bit pointless to add objective functions for uh, an application that doesn't work. So we'll wait until it, we'll wait until it works and then we'll add the uh, objective functions back So in. the current uh, work that you do is online in the feature branch? Uh, yeah, so there's two branches. So there's the tag debug tape branch, uh, which is the the coding version that we just talked about. And then we have a, it's called multi zone discrete joints for server machinery. And this is, uh, at the minute, it's a bit of a mess of a branch, but it, um, you want to work. yeah, <laughs> I made a mistake. I made a mistake. Uh, um, it's a bit of a mess, but you can find that. In fact, if you look in that branch, there is a commit where that adds uh, an entropy generation objective function. And if you follow that, you will get similar results. It doesn't work with a Python wrapper though. If you use the Python wrapper, it will not work. You know, I I've never used the Python wrapper, so uh, <laughs> it's way out beyond my skill. So the I guess the answer is if you feel adventurous, you can uh, we can contact you right yeah. now and you can work with the branch. Uh, but to really get it into development, yeah, I think I think that I think this this answer kind of applies to a lot of things in terms of machinery. Is the you maybe have to do a little bit of legwork to get it working yourself first, but someone is working on it somewhere. Yeah. Right, great. Uh, any other questions left? Else, we will have a break right now. And uh, for people online, we'll see you again after the break. Thanks again. Thanks.